This is A Rude Awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. On today's show, a new report from the Oakland Institute entitled Meet the Investors Behind the PHC Oil Palm Plantations in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. It exposes the financiers of the perpetual colonization of the DRC. I'll speak to grain researcher Devlin Kuyak and the Oakland Institute's policy director, Frederick Mousseau. But first, the news. I'm Christina Onestead with KPFA News Headlines. Five former Memphis police officers pled not guilty to second-degree murder and other charges in the violent arrest and killing of Tyree Nichols, an unarmed black man. To Darius Bean, Demetrius Haley, Desmond Mills Jr., Emmett Martin III, and Justin Smith made court appearances today before a state judge. The officers were fired after a police investigation into Nichols' killing. They're all out on bond. The police killing is a latest to prompt nationwide protests against police brutality. Nichols was black. All five officers charged in his death are also black. A white officer involved was fired but has not been charged. Judge James Jones Jr. urged patience in the courtroom today, noting the case could take time. As I've explained to the defendants, uh, this case can take some time. So we do ask for your patience, uh, your continued patience, your continued civility in this case. We understand that they're may be some uh, high emotions in this case, but we ask that you continue to uh, be patient with us. Everyone involved wants this case to be concluded as quickly as possible, but it's important for you all to understand that the state of Tennessee, as well as each one of these defendants, have an absolute right to a fair trial, and I will not allow any behavior that could jeopardize that right. Nichols was stopped by police for an alleged traffic violation and was pulled out of his car by an officer with at least one brandishing a gun. An officer hit Nichols with a stun gun. He ran away towards his nearby home, according to video footage released by the city. The officers were part of a crime suppression team known as the Scorpion Unit that has since been disbanded. In video, it shows Nichols being punched, kicked, and slugged with a baton as he yelled for his mother. Officials say a second Norfolk Southern train hauling hazardous materials has derailed, this time near Detroit. No chemicals spilled. This comes nearly two weeks after a Norfolk Southern derailment in Ohio left a mangled and charred mass of boxcars that had been carrying various hazardous chemicals, polluting the air and forcing evacuations. The head of the U.S. EPA got a first-hand look at the aftermath of the freight train derailment in Ohio yesterday, where toxic chemicals spilled or were burned off. Mark Miracle reports. EPA Administrator Michael Regan walked along a creek that still reeks of chemicals. He sought to reassure skeptical residents that the water is safe to drink and the air safe to breathe around East Palestine. Since the fire went out, EPA air monitoring has not detected any levels of health concern in the community that are attributed to the to the train derailment. But since the derailment, residents have complained about headaches and irritated eyes and finding their cars and lawns covered in soot. Ohio Democratic Senator Sherrod Brown said the railroad giant Norfolk Southern would be held accountable. That means accountable for the test for people to move back in, accountable for all the cleanup that we'll take to assure people that the water is safe and the air is safe and the soil is safe. The White House said teams from the Federal Health and Emergency Response and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention will go to East Palestine. At least five lawsuits have been filed against the railroad which announced this week it's creating a $1 million fund to help the community. Critics have called the $1 million pledge laughable. Norfolk Southern had record revenue last year of nearly $13 billion, 14% increase over the year before. I'm Mark Miracle. The United Nations now says it will need $1 billion to provide aid to Turkey and $400 million for aid in Syria as the death toll from a 7.8 magnitude earthquake tops 43,000, the vast majority in Turkey. Stefan Dejarik is a U.N. spokesperson. Funding, which covers a three-month period, will assist 5.2 million people and allow aid organizations to rapidly scale up vital support for government-led relief efforts in a number of areas, including food security, protection, education, water, and shelter. 
Dozens of contractors are now under investigation for shoddy developments that crumbled under last week's quake. The destruction of tens of thousands of buildings, some 50,000 according to Al Jazeera, has left millions of people homeless. Survivors are sharing their experiences of being under the rubble for days. In some cases, more than a week, a family was pulled from the rubble late yesterday. Human rights activists rallied outside El Salvador's consulate in San Francisco yesterday in support of five leading environmental activists who were behind the nation's ban on metals mining and have since been arrested. The Bay Area chapter of the Committee in Solidarity with People of El Salvador says the activists are being targeted because of their activism, though officials in El Salvador say they're suspects in a civil war crime decades ago. Here's an organizer speaking in a video of the action on social media. El Salvador is the only country in the world to have metallic mining bans. This, these arrests were in a long line of political persecuted arrests, but this one signals to the people that there will be an attempt to bring metallic mining back. And there's also a key significance with their arrests because it is on alleged crimes that had happened during the Civil War. But the people in El Salvador have not seen justice from the military dictatorship. A coalition of more than 250 organizations from dozens of nations have issued a joint statement critical of the arrest last month, noting El Salvador has failed to prosecute members of its military who were behind dozens of Civil War-era human rights violations, including a massacre that left 30 people dead and 189 disappeared in 1981. Moderna says it will continue to provide COVID vaccines free of charge to uninsured or underinsured people after the Biden administration's COVID public health emergency expires in May. The move appeared to be an attempt to squelch growing outrage over Moderna's plan for a hefty charge for its vaccines on the commercial market. That has infuriated lawmakers who note 100 percent of the funding for Moderna's vaccine came from the federal government. In a speech on the Senate floor, Senator Bernie Sanders denounced what he called the unprecedented corporate greed of the pharmaceutical industry. Between the years 2000 and 2018, drug companies in this country made over $8 trillion, that's with a T, $8 trillion in profits. Sanders also announced his health committee would hold a hearing next month called Taxpayers Paid Billions for It, so why would Moderna consider quadrupling the price of the COVID vaccine? With a forecast for the San Francisco Bay Area, partial sun, highs low 60s in Fresno and the central San Joaquin Valley, mostly sunny, highs low 60s. I'm Christina Onestead reporting for KPFA. Welcome back. We are back. This is A Rude Awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. Communities living adjacent to the PHC oil palm plantations in DRC, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, face arrests, beatings, and extrajudicial killings at the hands of private security and police. Under the majority ownership of Karamo Capital Management, KCM, conditions have recently further deteriorated with violent repression of workers on strike. And the new report from the Oakland Institute exposes additional U.S.-based institutional investors, Washington State University in St. Louis, Northwestern University, and Kamahimaha schools, who along with the University of Michigan, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, cannot stop talking about these folks, and the South African Government Employees Pension Fund are profiteering from the plantations through investments in KCM. And that is from the press release from the Oakland Institute. Now the report is entitled, Meet the Investors Behind the PHC Oil Palm Plantations in Democratic Republic of the Congo, exposes the aforementioned financiers. And on the show to talk about the history of colonial plantations and its continuation of that in its latest incarnation through private equity and the involvement of Development Bank is Devlin Kliek, and he is a Montreal-based researcher with the organization GRAIN, and that's an international organization that works to support small farmers and social movements 
in their struggles for community controlled and biodiversity based food systems. And of course, Frederic Mousseau who is the, the policy director at the Oakland Institute, where he coordinates the Institute's research and advocacy activities on land rights, food security, and agriculture. And uh, gentlemen, welcome to the show. Nice to be here, Sabrina. All right. Thank you, so Sabrina. For, lovely to be here again. Wonderful, wonderful. So, Frederick, we're going to have you go into the current investors and recent human rights and environmental abuses. So, bring it, uh, bring that to the uh, the uh, current time, current portion of the timeline. So, the current investors and recent human rights and environmental abuses, and discuss the company told what the company told the Oakland Institute in response. Uh, to the reports. So that's going to be very, very interesting. But let's go ahead and, and set the foundation for uh, what's been going on. Talk to us, Devlin, about the, the, um, the ongoing colonization of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Sabrina. Um, well, I, I, this plantation company um, that's operating in the DR Congo is um, like so many of the plantations that are still that still exist or um, that have been created uh, in Africa and elsewhere, but in Africa, you know, they all have a legacy of land theft to them. Uh, almost all of them have this legacy that dates back to the colonial period, um, and that is certainly true of the plantations in the Congo. Um, and these particular plantations, the PTC plantations. I mean, just to give you a sense, I, I was able to visit communities in um, one of the areas, the area of Lokutu. Um, it's uh, sort of in the north uh, eastern part of, of the DRC in an area with an you know, immense tropical forest right on the on the Congo River. Um, and it's it's hard to get to. It's fairly isolated. You have to take a you know, long boat ride over to, to get there. And with a, a colleague of mine from um, from the Cote, from Cote d'Ivoire and uh, our partner organization, the DRC, Rio, um, we visited the communities there, and I uh, had a meeting with about sixty different community leaders who had traveled. Some had walked for days to get there, um, and there was a there was a Congolese parliamentarian, local parliamentarian, who is also there. So it was part of the reason why they had all come. But they came with a prepared statement to denounce the over 100 years of occupation that they had endured uh, with this company uh, uh, that had taken and occupied all of their lands. And it, it was really shocking for me that the only document that they had ever seen um, to justify this again, a hundred year occupation of all their lands and territories was this flimsy document that didn't even correspond um, geographically to, to the area where they were living. Uh, it was you know, dated maybe 40, 50 years before it was a bad photocopy. Um, you know, just no real legality to it. And yet uh, there they were without any lands to farm um, and without the access to the, the forest and most importantly, the, the palm groves that they had historically had. Because what's important in that area of the Congo and in other parts of Africa is, is to note is that um, you know, over a hundred years ago, when uh, the Belgians violently occupied that uh, part of the DR Congo, or what was then the, the Congo, um, that that area was full of palm groves that the local populations had looked after. These were oil palms, native oil palms. Um, you know, palm oil is a, is a hugely important part of uh, the cuisine that that area, and and oil palms serve all kinds of other uses. And so the communities there had maintained these palm groves over over generations. And when the Belgians uh, occupied that area, they struck a deal with. Uh, a British industrialist named Lord Leverhulme, who um, was the uh, founder of uh, Sunlight Detergent, which we all know. And uh, his company would later become Unilever, which is one of the largest multinational companies in the world. And he wanted palm oil for his, uh, his growing market for, uh, for Sunlight Detergent. And so he 
struck a deal with the Belgian authorities. They granted him uh, over a million hectares of, of forest and he instituted a monopoly, which he justified by saying that, look, I'll, I'll build some, some oil palm, or palm oil mills, I'll, bring, I'll construct some churches, some schools, and I'll provide uh, jobs to, to the local people. Uh, and in exchange, I get you know, monopoly control over the whole area. Uh, I get monopoly control over the thriving trade in, in palm oil that, that pre-existed his, his entry there. Uh, and in a sense, what, the, what happened was that the, the Belgian army was used to uh, ensure that uh, there was forced labor for, for his operations. And then eventually they destroyed those palm groves and uh, built plantations. And that is the foundation of what exists today. Uh, so you fast forward into the, you know, the independence period with, with Mobutu uh, and the, the real sort of uh, accord that, that that dictatorship had with multinational corporations to continue on with the exploitation of uh, both mining resources and agricultural resources. And so Unilever continued to operate during that time. Um, uh, again, the, the local labor conditions were deplorable, uh, minimal amounts of uh, infrastructure and, and social services were provided, and the, uh, the local people were left highly dependent on just these you know, slave-like uh, jobs that they had with, with the company. Uh, in 2009, after um, a civil war, a, a horrible civil war in the Congo had um, uh, also ground sort of operations to a halt at the plantation uh, and things were, you know, Liver had really abandoned the area. Um, they sold the, those, the plantation, the, these, these concessions for, for over, you know, there were over 100,000 hectares in size, huge, huge forest concessions. They sold uh, the their palm oil plantations and the concession rights to a Canadian company that had no background in agriculture. It was really just a financial construction looking at speculating and acquiring agribusiness assets in, in Africa. And they took over the operations. They drained whatever uh, money that investors had, had put into and put into it. Uh, paid themselves lush salaries, you know, set up offices in, in London, ran things through a Cayman Island venture that had a, um, one of its shareholders was a, a, a Congolese politician very close to, to President Kabila at the time. Uh, and then uh, when they were near bankruptcy, these development banks from Europe and, and including uh, the United States is development bank OPIC at the time. Now it's uh, it's, uh, it's changed names, um, but the, the US development bank, European development banks stepped in to ensure the company wouldn't sink and provided over the, over the next five, six years, uh, over $150 million to this company. Again, on the justification that, you know, this was going to provide for the development needs of the communities and without such a company, you know, they would be, there would be nothing for them. There would be uh, no, uh, economic uh, activity in the area um, and, you know, without at all addressing the, this historical uh, land theft um, that had always existed and with the communities, which the communities had over time uh, on numerous occasions protested against and made uh, uh, calls for having their lands returned to them. So that's kind of the, you know, that just gives you a sense of of the, the situation there, it's not really different from a lot of other plantations uh, that continue to exist in Africa and that are owned by multinational corporations. Um, but the, uh, the, the brutality of that occupation, uh, starting with the Belgian uh, colonial period, I think is, is, is uh, I don't know if it's unique, but it's, it's certainly, certainly important to understanding what the current situation is. Absolutely. And um... There has been this ongoing fight uh, in the DRC um, for some level of autonomy because of the wholesale, you know, theft um, that you just described, uh, the colonialism, and it, its own government, you know, with folks like Kabila who have just been, you know, just 
been getting their kickbacks, you know, living high on the hog, if you would, and being allowed to, to, uh, you know, but by, by the international um, community, being allowed to just run rush up, rough shot on the people, but the people have risen up. Um, and the, the, mostly the youth in the last 10 years, um, from, from what I've mm-hmm. read and uh, reported on in the past. Um, Friends of the Congo, uh, Friends of the Congo.org, they've done a lot of uh, um, staying on the front lines of empowering the youth to try and um, do something about it. Um, what uh, There were a few um, pushes against the government um, throughout the history. Can you talk to us about that uh, in regards to this specific situation with Karamo Capital Management, KCM, and its relation with um, with the Congolese government? Well, I'll, maybe I'll let Frederick talk about the current investors, but I'll, I'll just say just that, you know, as probably some of your listeners are aware, the, the U.S. government uh, and the CIA were involved in the the assassination of uh, Patrice Lumumba. Of course, right. Um, mm-hmm. You know, when, and when the, uh, at the end of the, the Belgian colonial period um, and the installation of... Uh, of Mobutu, who became one of the most uh, corrupt and, and repressive dictators uh, in Africa, you know, and so that 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 had a lot to do with how these plantations were able to continue and what kind of conditions there were for for local people. You know, there was no that should have been a period when those lands would have been returned, when those forests would have been returned, but the, they continued to be under the the control of of, of multinational corporations. Uh, and then into the, the period of, uh, of Kabila, uh, again, you know, it was his right-hand man, um, Kakaya bin Karubi, who was the ambassador to, uh, to the United Kingdom, who handled much of the, uh, the deal-making with multinationals, uh, who had a shareholding, mysteriously, you know, in, in, in this corporation, uh, company Feronia. Uh, and, uh, you know, was clearly very, very instrumental in ensuring that that, that the plantations remain in the hands, again, of, of multinationals. And then the development banks, you know, this is sort of a new form of colonialism. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, development is a concept that, that emerged from uh, the colonial period where uh, empires were looking to justify their continued dominance over countries. And I think that's the same for today, the development banks you know, they play this role of justifying the continued um, theft and exploitation by multinational corporations in countries like the Congo by saying, you know, that if they can come in with some, some money and some you know, criteria around environmental and social governance that, you know, these operations can have bring all kinds of benefits for the people, well, that just simply hasn't happened. And this case is a really dramatic example of that and a good example of that. Um, you know, it's again, it's not unique, but it, it really shows how they just ignore the fundamental basis of the oppression and the injustice that exists there, which is the theft of land. They do nothing to address that. Uh, and everything goes into really just maintaining the ability of these companies to continue to extract and of money to, to end up, you know, going outside of the, of the Congo and, and certainly away from the local people. No doubt. No doubt. Yeah, it's just... Um... Uh, it's just an absolute travesty, absolute travesty that uh, these leaders, and you know, since Patrice Lumumba, and I appreciate you bringing up what happened with him, the the, the murder of Patrice Lumumba and um, what he meant to the people. And he was only around for a short time, but um, yeah, it just uh, sent uh, the DRC into a, a spiral that we're, we're witnessing now um, all over again, mm-hmm. all over again, all over again. Um, and folks, I just want to remind. And just to say, you. Sabrina. Oh yeah, please for, go ahead. Just yeah, yeah. Just to add to that, you know that that mm-hmm. that uh, that happened in numerous cases huh, throughout Africa, and there were so many important um, leaders with uh, really revolutionary ambitions who were who were assassinated, killed, uh, poisoned, um, and uh, governments were installed or friendly. To multinationals, and in many cases, uh, if you look through West and Central Africa, they those governments then started implementing more plantations mm-hmm. uh, with backing from the World Bank. Um, so, in this case, like in Nigeria, you had a military dictatorship which just you know 
used its power to displace local people, install these plantations with the connivance of corporations like uh, Sokfin, for instance, which is a, a company uh, Frederick knows well, um, that uh, uh, then using public funds, using these, this debt that uh, the World Bank had orchestrated uh, to build these plantations, displace the local people. And then through the structural adjustment programs, where these plantations were privatized because of supposed mismanagement by the, the public bodies, uh, those companies then take them over. And today we're left with a situation where companies like Sokfin or in, you know, in PHC in the, in the Congo are being managed by uh, these, these foreigners who are, are experts at exploitation and the, and the people are still, you know, again, uh, without their, their lands and forests that they need for their own, for their own well-being. No doubt. No doubt. Yeah. It's, um, yeah. Nowadays you're looking at like, uh, government groups like, uh, or United out of the United States, like, uh, AFRICOM who are supposedly coming in to, to, uh, to, um, to solidify, uh, some type of, uh, you know, peace and it's, it's nothing but nothing but because it's all, you know, just a bunch of crimes against the people. And, uh, folks, I just want to remind you that this is a climate crisis show, but, uh, um, just a reminder, the expansion and intensification of agriculture is not only killing the indigenous people that are fighting against these multinational corporations that have free reign over their ancestral land, but also destroying habitats for indigenous species. Expansion of agriculture into previous forested areas causes a reduction in habitat. Habitat loss remains a primary cause of indigenous biodiversity decline, decline and that is why this is important. This is an important conversation. Now, Frederic, I'm going to switch gears just a little bit and bring it to the present. Um, talk to us about KCM in this case, in, in this part of the timeline, this current event or current situation, uh, Karamo Capital Management. Now, they're an investment management firm that first invested in the PHC plantations in 2017 at a time when the wrongdoing of the company and many issues faced by local communities had already had already been widely documented folks knew people knew what was going on and still here they are frederick go ahead thank you sabrina just to add to to the, to the background it's, it's also important for the listeners to know that we are talking about the second rainforest in the world this is a congo basin it is a huge tropical forest that is there that has been logged over the years, but it is still there uh, with uh, huge amounts of uh, trees and carbon, of course. And we are talking about uh, plantations, old palm plantations that, that are that are being uh, expanded actually at the moment by this uh, by this company on forest. And and, uh, and traditionally, as Devlin said. People in Congo used to live with, they used to, to have produce palm oil, but it was in a way that was farmed by the communities, by the families, uh, with uh, no chemical, with uh, all kind of other crops, and within the forest. It was a way that was certainly the most sustainable way to conserve the forest and to have sustainable livelihoods. And this has been replaced by these industrial plantations where Everything was uh, crushed, destroyed to, to establish these big, these you know these long lines over thousands of hectares of, uh, of plantations, uh, and uh, and just to to connect with what uh, Devlin said, our, our first report on this Kuramo Capital Management PHC plantation uh, in DRC was called uh, in Leopold in King Leopold Steps, and it is. It, it was really about taking a stock of this uh, of this colonial history because we are talking about plantations that were established 110 years ago by King Leopold by the Belgians and and today they are still there and today we have this uh, so it's a Cuomo capital management it's an investment firm based in New York City it's not the Chinese it's uh, right here uh, and. Um, it's controlled by, uh, by a group of, of shareholders. And then with this company, they go and seek a number of investors. And uh, they are largely financed by a number of uh, institutional investors. So you name some of them. 
just to re repeat, uh, we have so BN Melinda Gates, we have the University of Michigan, Washington University in St. Louis, Northwestern University, just to cite a few. So it's it's quite striking that from all this old uh, colonial history, we have today the same plantation, the same suffering, but uh, the, the new the new face of capitalism with uh, with uh, new investors uh, involved there, and. Unfortunately, as you said, uh, the, the violence has been going on for years and years. The, the plantations were secured this long ago, but in, in the meantime, the population has grown. There are many villages, many communities, thousands of people are living there, and they have no place to expand their, uh, their livelihood and their agricultural activities because uh, their, all, all the land is taken by the plantations. And the repression on, on these people to when they try to, to, to go to the forest to, to uh, uh, secure their own uh, livelihoods is, is just horrific. What we've seen in the previous few years, and especially last year, has been really an intensification of this repression. Starting just January, just a year ago, there were two young men in their 30s killed by the security guards. So it's, sometimes it's a private security guard, sometimes it's a police, sometimes they walk together. It's, it's not clear, but clearly the police is there for the, co for the corporation to protect their, uh, their, their business and, uh, and they're really working on their, on their behalf, even if officially the, the company will say it's not them, it's the police. But just one year ago, one young man was killed by the police and drawn into a river because he had stolen plastic chairs. I mean, allegedly stolen plastic chairs from her after a meeting. It, this, is a kind of, this is a kind of thing that happens there. In, a, in September the last year, just a few months ago, dozens of uh, houses were looted, attacked and looted by these guards and the police. So they, were, they say, oh, we are looking for uh, uh, fruits that have been stolen by the communities. So they raid houses and they beat people, they arrest many of them. Many people spend weeks or months sometimes in jail in Congo because they are opposing this, uh, these plantations or because they are accused of stealing palm fruits. And it's, uh, again, it's something very striking that, you know, people take their land, people take your land and then they accuse you of stealing fruits from your land. And uh, knowing on top of that, that uh, as Devin said, they were uh, all time uh, grown before the plantations were established. And uh, how can they say this is from the plantation or this is from somewhere else? This is another question. And so just, just to start another one, and, and just now last month, uh, you had um, workers of the plantation who, uh, who started a strike at uh, the Botica plantation for uh, poor wages, just asking for better wages and better working conditions. And, uh, and after one day of strike, the company called the police who shot into the crowd and two people were injured. And again, two workers, two young men uh, injured by the, by the shots of the police. So this is what the, the, the kind of abuses that are happening there. And these investors are all aware, very well aware. Just in the last year, we wrote, we wrote three times to each of them individually uh, to let them know about all these abuses and to ask them about their action or reaction or to do something about it. And we haven't heard from any of them and we're still waiting. My goodness, my goodness. Again, folks, I'm speaking with, and that was the voice actually of Frederic Mousseau. He is the policy director at the Oakland Institute, where he coordinates the Institute's research and advocacy activities on land rights, food security, and agriculture. And also speaking with Devlin Kuyek, and he is a Montreal-based researcher with Grain, an international organization that works to support small farmers and social movements in their struggles for community control and biodiversity-based food systems. And why am I talking to these folks, these good people? 
Well, there's a report out, the latest report out by the Oakland Institute, oaklandinstitute.org, Meet the Investors, entitled Meet the Investors, Behind the PHC Oil Palm Plantations in the DRC, which exposes who these financiers are. Um, Frederic and Devin, please feel free to uh, to interject. Oh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Frederic. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Just to say, so we, we have written to all the investors, none of them has responded, but we we contacted also the company itself, Kuramo Capital Management, and we heard from them just a few days ago. Oh. And, uh, and very interestingly, they, they do recognize the violence, the structural violence in these plantations, and they, uh, according to them, the violence is due to the rise in the price of oil palm on the international markets, which, again, according to them, has led to an increase in the theft of fruits by local communities. Mm. And therefore, the police is policing and uh, going after the thieves. But it is, we, we were really deeply shocked to, to, to read this reply from them as uh, and first you assume that because you have high oil prices, uh, people are gonna steal because they're Africans, of course, they're gonna steal whatever is there. And, uh, and two, uh, uh, you, you really, even if there is theft, you, you, you can't, overlook the fact that people have been left for decades without their land. They are in dire poverty. They have no chance to uh, develop their own livelihoods or invest for themselves because their land is is taken and their only chance in life is to get a job as a security or as a worker for this plantation. And what do you expect? I mean, it's, uh, and so, Frederick, I, I think it's even worse than that because, in fact, what they were saying is not that in reference to the international palm oil prices, because the communities don't can't sell in the international market, although they do have markets there that exist between the different neighboring countries. But it's, they're talking about the local market, and that company has always said, "Oh no, we're going to you know build up and export uh, um, supply, or we're going to uh, be able to provide for the." palm oil needs of the capital of Kinshasa. They never talked about that they were gonna compete with the local palm oil producers because if you go in that area, it's just full of local, you know, small scale palm oil producers and the local communities are left out of that because they can't access any oil palms or forests to you know, harvest fruits and be able to produce their own palm oil. So of course, with their, you know, with the price of palm oil as it is, it's a good market in, the, in that area. And there's lots of people who, who produce locally. Those communities deserve to be able to access that as well. They can't be subjected to this, you know, the horrid slave-like wages that don't even meet the minimum wage, uh, you know, in the, in the, in the plantations. Um, they should be able to produce palm oil. And there was one community uh, that took over an area of, of, uh, uh, of oil palms that the company had sort of abandoned. And they started producing their own their own palm oil. Uh, this was just before the company was handed over entirely to uh, to Kuramo. and uh, they were doing quite well. You know, there was of course some challenges, but they were you know it was a community initiative, and they were very happy to get that land back and to be able to engage in the production of, of palm oil for for local markets. And that was one of the first things that Kuramo did was to go after those communities and to stop them. Uh, from producing from producing their own palm oil, um, so we've always said to the development banks, you know, the the land should just be given back to the communities as they requested, and then they will produce their own palm oil. They don't need this multinational corporation to come in there with its high paid executives, uh, you know, and 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 all kinds of waste that it generates, and and the money and and resources that it extracts from the communities. The communities are more than capable. In fact, they're the originators. <laughs> Well, production. They don't need any lessons from these multinationals, you know. So a lot of this can be resolved just by giving the lands back back to the people. It's very true. And and on the top of that, just to add to, to what David said, uh, what the, I mean, again, we are surprised by this admission from them. But another thing the company told us was that some of the people who were arrested 
were arrested because they were running their own artisanal meal in their home. So it's mm. local people doing their own oil palm. And so for, for the companies, this is not acceptable which is because it's, it's competition directly from the local communities who try to, to make a living. Mm -hmm. And so people have been thrown to jail because they try to, to do oil palm themselves without these corporations. Well, that's the sick part. One you of know, the things that's... too that I think is mm -hmm. super important for people to understand about how this connects with climate is, you know, when you see the involvement of development banks, you see the involvement of pension funds, university endowments, philanthropies. These are the, you know, the investors that like to consider themselves as the, you know, the ESG investors, the environmental and social governance investors, the socially responsible investors. And they are looking increasingly for these kind of green investments. Mm -hmm. And in their mind, plantations in Africa fit that bill. So do all kinds of other problematic investments. But, you know, this is, this is like kind of a, a, a wave of money that's coming in. Uh, where you have you know, private equity funds that are totally unaccountable, that are based in tax havens, that are, you know, it's very difficult for the, the communities to have any kind of power vis-a-vis -vis these, these companies. And they're being backed by, you know, uh, as uh, the Oakland Institute's report shows, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, you know, University of Washington's endowment. I mean, these are it's it's really hypocritical of these investors to be involved in this investment and it's something i think they need to be held accountable for no doubt they need to be held accountable I, and you know it's like you know i saw a documentary uh, years ago about how you know this uh, this woman she's you know she was illegally in the drc illegally supposedly illegally right um taking the the, the mining uh the the, the gems the, the the precious gems going over across the border uh, to uh, some of the other Great Lake region, uh, um, Rwanda and whatnot, and Uganda, and selling them so that she could put her kids through school, doing it illegally. Okay, this is her land. This is where she's from. This is where this is her ancestral land, and she's being penalized for it. Now, back to what you were saying, Devlin, in regards to um, these universities that are investing. What about the students of these universities? And Frederick, please, you know, chime in. Um, have they been informed? Yeah. Is there any pushback by that? Is there any push to to inform the students about what their university is investing in? I mean, because that that would be have, a, a very good strategy, you know, as far as uh, pushing against what uh, what the KCM and, and multi, all these other multinational corporations are doing through their universities. Go ahead. Uh, right on, Sabrina. Of course, this is uh, this is the hope we have is that students, now that they are aware, are going to mobilize. And we had in previous uh, land grab deals that we've exposed in the past in Africa, we've seen amazing mobilization by students who managed to really uh, force the universities to, uh, to, to stop this kind of investment. So we really hope it is going to happen. And uh, we've been in touch with students in Michigan, and we really uh, hope they, they will take, uh, they will be also accountable and, uh, and take their own responsibility because this is, uh, this is university and in, in endowment who are investing, but will get returns from these investments to, to run their activities. So this is really about students going to school with a part of the, of the funding for their, for their education coming from these communities in Congo. And, and people have really need to realize that it's, uh, it's a responsibility for everyone who is associated with these universities to, uh, to, to do the right thing. And we're gonna keep uh, holding them accountable and, and putting pressure and hopefully there will be this mobilization really helpful. Yeah, it, it ties a lot with the divestment movements that are happening, you know, our students or, uh, Pension fund holders are are demanding that there that there be a divestment from say fossil fuel companies. Um, well, some student groups, for instance, at Harvard, have been calling for similar divestment from from land grabs. Uh, you know, and linking that and understanding the connection with the climate crisis that's happening. And then you know the pushback that comes from these institutions. Oh, you know, we have a fiduciary duty. Uh, our our priority has to be to you know fund 
the university or to say in the case of pension funds to you know, support the retirement savings of, 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 our, of our worker clients. Um, but I don't, you know, that, that argument doesn't hold. And, and really, if, if you have a pension fund, um, you know, that is trying to uh, invest for uh, workers in their retirement, but is do, doing so by way of destroying the livelihoods of other people and of other workers, I mean, that, that's just, it, it just doesn't cut it. And I think, you know, the more people are uh, engaging with that question and you realize, okay, there's, yes, we need to put pressure, but there's a bigger issue here in that the people who control the supply of money, the Black Rocks, uh, the pension fund managers, uh, even the university endowments, they have a, uh, a model of investment that um, is, is part and parcel of the climate crisis. It is, you know, it, it's, you can't disentangle it. And we need to find other ways to both look after our retirements, to both look after public education uh, and university education and resolve the climate crisis. And I don't think that that's gonna be done when the money supply is in the hands of, you know, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation or the, <laughs> um, the University of Washington's endowment run by financial managers or even some of these pension fund managers. You know, we have to find other ways of doing it. Yeah, and there are so, other what, ways. What we have, mm -hmm. Go ahead, Frederick. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, no, no, what we, what we have seen uh, following our reports is a, a big PR effort by Coramo, by the company, to show to showcase their corporate social responsibility uh, at work. So they, they put on their website photos of the new classroom they've painted or the new Jeez. clinics they have, uh, they have started. And it's, uh, it's really the argument they put to these institutional investors saying, see, we are doing development for these people. Without us, they won't have a school or they won't have an, an hospital. Mm, one school. It's really, yeah, and, and uh, I mean, you take the land from the people and then you say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a building there, you'll be happy. I mean, it's, it's such, a, such a colonial mentality that is there that, that is just unbelievable. And on the it top is. of that, Sherry, Sherry on the cake, uh, mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. company and the, the, the individuals who control this company who are telling us about all their corporate social responsibility. are also, we have found out, involved in mining and they've just started uh, in the past few months, a new company called Integrated Energy Materials, IEM, which is about mining in DRC. And we know the wealth of minerals that are there in DRC. So these people were telling us we, we are there to do development. They do oil palm and now they're gonna expand into mining because mining, of course, we know is so good for development. And uh, it, it is such a joke that they keep a straight face telling the world that they're doing development while we, we just see so uh, blatantly uh, another uh, instance of exploitation and colonialism at play. No doubt, no doubt. It's really, it's, it's absolutely, um, yeah, it's laughable. It is all laughable. I was doing a series of shows uh, with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and how they've been pushing against uh, you know, with their gr so-called green revolution, which is just a bunch of green washing uh, in, in uh, about six or six or seven different uh, African countries, um, trying to destroy agroecology and trying to destroy uh, the indigenous uh, people's way of life. I mean, and just it, blatantly doing it. And there's been so much, there's been this huge clarion call against what they're doing and they just keep doing it. They're ignoring it. And, you know, where is the United Nations on this? You know, they, we just had COP26, you know, conference of the parties please you know it's just it's 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 just a, a joke it's more of like the conference of the funded parties you know um we got a few more minutes left uh let's go ahead and uh, devlin go ahead and give us some last thoughts and then frederick go ahead and close us out devlin go ahead well i would just say uh you know in, in thinking about this like the, the 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 propaganda and the greenwashing that's used around it's just it's you can it clear it all and just think about how this is a colonial plantation, you know, right. uh, people, 
need to understand that. And there is absolutely no justification for that model uh, at this time. Um, uh, you know, there are countless reasons, but but it's just that basic understanding. And so there's nothing that any of these companies can say that can uh, get away from that reality. And then and the the only way to deal with it is to give land back to the people and get these people, these investors out, whatever, whatever's required. No doubt. Frederick, go ahead. We we know about old palm that does it's coming from the Congo Basin. It was uh, traditionally there, and then it, uh, it was really expanded into millions of hectares of plantations in Asia and in, in Indonesia and Malaysia in particular. But now these countries can't expand anymore because everything is already covered with plantations. So the new frontier is really back to Africa. And what we are seeing in, in DRC today is, is a trend that is intensifying around on, on all the, the, the tropical part of the continent to expand oil palm plantations. And, and we are told again a lot about sustainability of oil palm, but we, we know very well this is about the billions of dollars that these companies are making out of this oil palm. And, and again, on the, on, the, on the back of the Africans and on the land that they own, and they can't even use to feed themselves. So it is shocking. It is, it is a new neocolonialism for sure. But we have to be aware at the time we need to, to do more to protect our, our, our forest, to, to develop expand agroecology, to, to do the right thing for us, for our planet and, uh, and, and the climate. We are doing just the opposite because capitalism is still the driving force, expanding and expanding these this very destructive practices. So yes, thank you for echoing our, our work because this really has to stop and we really need to, to, to dramatically change path. No doubt, you know, no doubt. It, you know, it's a, it's you know, it's about the kids. It's about the kids and and empowering those students, well, informing them, and letting them know that they have the power to to control the the, the divestment of the schools that they're attending. You know, uh, empowering them, and of course, you know, continuing to empower the people against these racist, racist, you know, multinational corporate corporations. I, I it's just the, the the level of racism, the the amount of the. the that's being allowed today, 2022, it's still going on and it is fueled by greed. And I, to, to, I, I'm still trying to wrap my head around how greedy people can be. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's insidious <laughs> and it is sick. And I just don't, I mean, you know, it's like, you know, I get a pair of shoes and it's like, all right, cool. I got a pair of shoes. And you know, I just, I just need a couple pairs of shoes, you know, but some people need 20 pairs of shoes. You know what? You know, it's just, I, I just, I can't wrap my head around. I'm just, it's anyway, folks, folks, that last voice that you heard was Monsieur Frédéric Mousseau. <laughs> and who is this guy? Thank well, he is, I appreciate you. He's the policy director at the Oakland Institute, where this uh, report originated. He, he coordinates the Institute's research and advocacy activities on land rights, food security, and agriculture. And Monsieur Devlin Kuyek, okay, I butchered that, sorry, is a Montreal-based researcher <laughs> with the organization Grain, an international organization that works to support small farmers and social movements in their struggles for community-controlled and biodiversity-based food systems. Simple, simple way of living. Hello. And why are we talking, why was I talking to these folks? Well, there's a report, the latest report out by the Oakland Institute, oaklandinstitute.org. Meet the investors behind the PHC oil palm plantations in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And like Devlin said, this is happening all over Africa. But the focus on the DRC is very, very, very important because you know, the way I'm communicating with you depends on what comes out of the DRC. The way I communicate on, on the phone, it depends on what's coming out of the DRC. And, you know, if they're running roughshod on the people, it, it can't last. It's not a sustainable way of living or making a living. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being on A Rude Awakening. Truly appreciate you taking the time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sabrina. Thanks Thank for you me. for having us, Sabrina, and thanks for all what you're doing. It's important. Appreciate you guys both. Thank you.
folks. If you want to find out more about grain, G-R-A-I-N dot org, G-R-A-I-N dot org. Again, they're a Montreal-based uh, organization, international organization that works to support small farmers and social movements in their struggles for community controlled and biodiversity-based food systems. And they do a lot of work with the Oakland Institute, the Oakland Institute dot org. And that does it for another edition of A Rude Awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. And yes, this was a rerun, a repeat, if you would. And that was from exactly one year ago, February 18th, 2022. And I just want to let you know, good people, KPFA's Winter Fun Drive is coming up starting next week on Tuesday. So that means that A Rude Awakening will be back on the air on the 17th, March 17th. Always real radicals on the controls. I'll be back in two weeks. Same time, same place. Stay tuned for a rebroadcast of Democracy Now! coming up next. And remember, good people, embrace each other as we embrace the mother of us all. Thank you for listening. on time back by the beach still gonna bring the heat Howard Zinn. Orwell said that whoever controls the past controls the future. Uh, and whoever controls the present controls the past. So whoever is in charge of our society can decide uh, what our history will look like. And by deciding what our history will look like, they will decide our future. Well, that made history very important to me because it, it meant that history was not disengaged from society, that to create a more democratic history meant that, that you were at least playing some part in uh, trying to create uh, a more democratic society. Storytelling for social change on KPFA. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online worldwide at kpfa.org.